And now a word from our sponsor. These days, internet privacy is a major concern to us all. All sorts of snoopers want to monitor and collect data about your online activities. NordVPN shields you from them. Internet service provider monitors the whole internet traffic that pours through its servers and stores logs of your online activity. Your data, such as financial information, interests and passwords and emails, might be valuable to third parties, hackers and even government. When you browse the internet using a VPN, your communications are encrypted, allowing you to stay private online. VPN also allows you to access content not normally available in your location and connect to hundreds of remote servers in different locations securely. Sign up today at nordvpn.com slash markfelton and enter the promo code markfelton to get 70% off a three-year plan and an extra month for free. Protect yourself online today with NordVPN. It was the most terrifying weapon to have entered the war before the atomic bomb, a giant, killer missile that could not be intercepted or shot down, and arrived so fast at its target that no warning could be given. The weapon was the V-2, Germany's latest vengeance weapon, a liquid-fueled ballistic missile that stood 45 feet tall when launched by special mobile firing teams to ensure they could not easily be located by roving Allied reconnaissance aircraft and fighter bombers. Weighing 27,600 pounds, the rocket delivered a warhead 2,200 pounds in weight of Amatol high explosive up to 200 miles away and it was fast, reaching a maximum speed of 3,580 miles per hour to an altitude of 55 miles above the Earth, before falling back towards its target on a long-range trajectory at up to 1,790 miles per hour at impact, too fast for any anti-aircraft gun to engage or even see. Developed as part of a series of rockets, the Aggregat missiles, through the 1930s and 40s, by early September 1943, Werner von Braun, one of the leading designers, promised the long-range bombardment commission that the A-4, as the Germans called it, was almost complete. But in reality, delays and difficulty manufacturing parts meant that the V-2 was not ready for action against England until mid-1944, by which time a desperate Hitler was snatching at any new wonder weapon that might stave off imminent defeat. But the Allies already knew all about the V-2, thanks to some very brave Poles and a daring RAF mission to retrieve an intact V-2 from right under the Germans' noses. Initially, Royal Air Force photo reconnaissance flights over Peenemünde, Germany's secret missile development complex on the Baltic Sea, had revealed the existence of another vengeance weapon, the V-1 flying bomb. An early cruise missile, the V-1 was to be used against England in a large-scale robot bomb campaign from June 1944 onwards. Almost 2,000 flying bombs fell victim to Allied fighter planes. But the RAF also photographed the early V-2. Large-scale RAF bombing raids on Peenemünde forced the Germans to relocate V-2 design work to an underground complex near Lake Traunsee in Austria. Test launching of the V-2s would be undertaken at a camp, Heidelager, a large SS training facility outside Blizna in Poland. Deeply concerned by V-2 development and its evident highly advanced technology that could be a serious threat to the British home front, Allied planners needed more information about the weapon and, if possible, an actual missile that they could examine. The latter seemed unlikely. 
Brave Austrians working at the Lake Traunsee facility had smuggled technical drawings to the Allies, but had been executed by the Gestapo after discovery. Then an opportunity had presented itself. Precisely because of the relocation of the missile test range facilities from Germany to Poland because of RAF air raids. Poland had been under a very brutal German occupation since October 1939, but a huge resistance force had grown up in the country out of the wreckage of its pre-war armed forces, the Polish Home Army. Britain, through the Polish government in exile in London, heavily supported the Home Army, dropping weapons and supplies into Poland by aircraft, and supporting operations via special operations executive agents parachuted into the country. The large wooded areas around Blizna were well known to the Home Army, and its forces were present in strength. The Home Army carefully monitored V-2 launches and tried to scavenge pieces of the missiles that crashed down to earth. This was difficult and dangerous work, with them often skirmishing with SS and other German forces patrolling the region. They had already managed to smuggle out to Britain several important V-2 components that dramatically demonstrated just how advanced the new German missile was. The Home Army had its own scientists from Warsaw on hand to assist them. The 20th of May 1944, a test V-2 was launched and landed mostly intact in a marsh near Sanaki on the Bug River. Home Army troops quickly located the crash site and hid the large rocket under piles of reeds, as the SS were also searching for it. Then the scientists from Warsaw arrived and dismantled the V-2, which was then taken out of the area in pieces, hidden under piles of potatoes on farmers' carts. All 25,000 parts were carefully recorded, diagrams were drawn, and the components were photographed. The most important parts were placed in 19 suitcases. This material was urgently required in London. Preparations were made to smuggle this material out of occupied Poland right under the Germans' noses. The most straightforward method was by air, but this was no mean task. Number 267 Squadron, an RAF transport unit equipped with the Douglas C-47 Dakota 5, was assigned the retrieval operation. Based at Brindisi in Italy, it was decided that a single Dakota would fly across occupied Europe and land in a sugar beet field 37 miles east of the city of Krakow, at the town of Zaborov. Home Army soldiers would secure the landing strip, guide the Dakota in, and load the 19 suitcases aboard. The operation was extremely dangerous. German forces were encamped close by, and the Dakota would be flying through German-controlled airspace, with the dangers of flak and night fighters ever-present. It was piloted by New Zealander Flight Lieutenant Stanley Culliford, and because of the language barrier, the co-pilot was a Polish RAF flight lieutenant. The Dakota had been specially modified with extra fuel tanks for the 18-hour flight. Though time was pressing, heavy rains in June that inundated the proposed landing ground caused the mission to be postponed until late July 1944. Then, to add to the tension, the day before the operation, codenamed Wild Horn 3, was about to be launched, a German flak unit of a hundred men and three guns took up residence at a school just one kilometre from the airstrip. Three German Fieseler 156 Storch spotter planes actually landed on the field that the Dakota was due to land on the following night. The next morning, the Luftwaffe planes left, but the German flak remained nearby. The Home Army brought in more troops to defend the makeshift airstrip in case the Germans tried to interfere with the operation that very night. In order to guide the Dakota in, men with oil lanterns lined the field. On the 25th of July, the Dakota arrived over the field on schedule. The oil lamps were unmasked and the Dakota circled once, then put down. was absolutely tremendous, but as yet the Germans hadn't responded. As soon as the Dakota rolled to a halt, 
Home Army soldiers quickly began loading the plane with the precious V2 components and a handful of passengers. Then the engines were restarted, the brakes released, and the throttles moved up to taxi the plane round for takeoff. But nothing happened. The wheels had sunk in the muddy ground. Flight Lieutenant Culliford, acutely aware of the Germans nearby and the nature of the secret operation, suggested burning the plane and then leaving with the Home Army. But the Polish RAF officer, Kazimierz Schreyer, was determined to stay and fix the issue. After hasty discussions, the plane was laboriously unloaded, and after lodging wooden boards from farm carts beneath the wheels, the plane was moved onto firmer ground, reloaded, and then took off. Thankfully, the Germans never realised what was happening, probably chalking the engine sounds down to Storch spotter planes. The Dakota made it safely back to Brindisi without incident, delivering the V-2 parts to waiting British scientists. While scientists furiously tried to work out how to stop the V-2, the first missile landed on London on the 8th of September 1944, killing three people. The Germans stepped up launches, and over the following months Britain was hit 1,402 times in the first ballistic missile campaign in history. Belgium was also struck 1,664 times, and France and the Netherlands received smaller numbers. In London, the V2s would kill 2,754 people and injure 6,523. The material smuggled out by the Dakota from occupied Poland allowed the British to fully understand the technology and to try and develop ways of misdirecting the missiles. But the bombardment never stopped. The last V-2 landing on Orpington in Kent, the 27th of March 1945, causing the last fatality on British soil of World War II. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share. You can also visit my new audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton, details below. And also consider supporting both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box below.